Hello again, welcome to another episode of the Iranian Market Minute. Today is Monday, June 6th, and this is episode number 134. My name is Justin Hewn. I'm your host. I'm the founder and publisher of the Uranium Insider Pro newsletter, the only investing newsletter that focuses solely on uranium and publishes on a regular monthly basis. As always, nothing that you see or hear in this podcast is intended to be investing advice. I'm not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Please always do your own due diligence when it comes to investing and always take responsibility for your own choices. All right, good to be back. Hope you all had a great weekend. Pretty quiet day across the market. It's going to be a relatively short episode, not a whole lot to report on. Um, I'm going to talk about a bit about the energy crisis that uh, appears to be migrating into the United States and the warnings that are being fired off from mainstream media and the Biden administration. And going to talk about some uh, Japanese restart news that came out today. Um, positive news on that front. But before we do, we are going to jump into the daily scoreboard and we will look at the charts across the sector. Spot price of uranium sits at 50.75 a pound, up over a dollar since Friday. Spot price continues to move up. It'll be interesting to see if Sput did in fact buy any pounds today as they have been stacking cash. Uh, they were trading at greater than the 1% premium to NAV at various points throughout the day today. So they were likely raising even more money today. Either way, we have seen the traders um, go ahead and uh, trade the, the spot price of uranium up and down relative to the NAV of SPUT. So even with SPUT out of the market, the fact that the SPUT trust has been moving up and that net asset value represents a higher spot price, therefore traders will buy uranium, sell uranium and picking up, uh, picking up pennies off the ground. So uh, curious to see how that ends up today in terms of SPUT's purchasing. Either way, the spot price continues to move up here, even if it's on uh, somewhat lower volume. After being out of the market for the last four to five weeks, SPUT has now raised capital in the last six out of seven trading days, although they have not bought any more pounds of uranium. On Friday, they issued 485,000 new units, raised an additional 6.1 million in new money, but again, did not buy any pounds. They closed Friday at a very small premium to NAV, 0.02%, barely just basically trading at their net asset value. Um, SPUD has taken in 68 million in new investor capital over the past seven trading days, and they have raised 803.6 million in new capital year to date. So they continue to stack some money here over the past week or so. Very curious to see how they've been doing this. Now, uh, likely they're right around, if not breaching $100 million in cash. Coming into the day, they had $91.4 million in cash, and I believe they were raising more cash today. Uh, let's see if they drew any of that down to buy uranium. Now, technically, they can hold cash uh, up to 10% of their net asset value, which would be roughly around $285 million in cash. And right now, they're just under $100 million. So they can continue to stack that cash um, uh, without purchasing any pounds, driving up the price of uranium um, by proxy, simply by their NAV being raised. Uh, so very curious how they're operating right now. The ETFs reported no changes in outstanding shares. Typically, we're going to need to see um, heavy up days, heavy down days in uh, URA and URNM to see a change in outstanding shares. Heavy up days, you will actually see them issuing shares into the market to buy the underlying holdings and raise cash. Heavy down days, you'll see them selling down the holdings to raise cash to buy back their own shares, uh, also known as redemptions. We are not seeing any of that over the past week or so in either ETF because the volumes have been low. Um, the market has been mostly directionless, although we were up, you know, most equities in the space are up around 20% since the bottom, but we've been climbing a wall of worry on low volume. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the charts here. Starting off with URA, up 0.41% on the day on negligible volume, volume, lowest volume we've seen in months for URA, um, low as far as a daily trading volume goes. So volume continues to lack, but we are seeing at least a bit of an uptrend. We're sort of consolidating here over the past week or so. How are we looking relative to the S&P? URA relative to the S&P also hanging in there after um, balancing off of that trend line. Now, I do like to look at URNM relative to the S&P because it's more of a pure play, better representation of the uh, a basket of uranium miners. And we are definitely hanging on to that uptrend in terms of outperformance of the broad market. And the S&P also had a pretty indecisive day. Either way, we this uptrend is maintained here, and that is good to see. 
Cameco barely down on the day. Uh, really not a whole lot going on here. Minimal volume, just very indecisive across the board. Not really much to report on here. Sput probably stealing the show today up 0.77% on the, excuse me, 0.7% on the day. Printing a hammer on the day. It did trade down, traded back up. Uh, pretty nice close for Sput. But again, look at the volume. The volume is just not there. Uh, risk is still off. In, in my opinion, across uh, across multiple asset classes, if not most asset classes here. And this is the vehicle where we're looking to see volume come back in, come back in heavy um, on these uptrends. The previous uptrend, we saw a big increase in volume as we saw uh, the trust trade up. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. Um, these big moves uh, coincide with big moves up in volume, and we are just not seeing that yet. But at least we are not going down. The sellers appear to be exhausted here. All right. So for the mailbag section, um, I just wanted to report on, on a couple of things that we're seeing out there. One of those is Japanese restarts. And another one that I'll talk about first is uh, the Biden administration seemingly hitting the panic button here in terms of expectations of uh, an energy crisis here in the States. So um, they're, they're ramping up solar panel production in the U.S., also dropping tariffs on solar panels being imported from the East. The energy crisis that has been plaguing Europe uh, recently, actually over the past year or so, and Japan more recently, is this about to hit the shores of the United States? Well, we're certainly getting the warning signs of that. Um, at this point, pretty much everyone is aware of the energy crisis has, has embroiled Europe of late. In fact, as well underway before the war in Ukraine, as natural gas prices spiked, uh, inflicting a lot of pain on European consumers. Situation is far more precarious now with uh, the extreme dependency on Russian oil and gas. But either way, uh, Europe has found itself in a serious energy crisis with massively increased pricing on uh, energy and on electricity, on gasoline, on natural gas, on oil, etc. Now we're hearing about pleas from the Japanese government for its citizens to ration power usage, openly suggesting that families gather in one room and watch one TV with the air conditioning off. That's actually a suggestion coming from the government. Um, this is a, obviously a challenge in the summer months in the humid country of Japan in the summer. Well, now in the US, after warnings from the Wall Street Journal and CNN over the weekend about summer rolling blackouts because, because of strains on the electrical grid, the Biden administration is trying to look like they're doing something here now that they've drawn down the strategic petroleum reserve to put a lid on oil prices, which didn't work at all. In two moves with respect to solar panels, the administration has invoked the Defense Production Act to boost solar panel, panel manufacturing. And secondly, they're waiving tariffs imported on imported solar panels. So what do we know about this? Where have we seen this movie play out before? Where have we seen um, a big government supported move into renewables? Germany, correct. Uh, how did that turn out? Didn't turn out that well. Uh, Germany obviously has struggled with energy since they phased out nuclear and gone all into uh, renewables, solar and wind. Especially solar has been um, not a failure, but has performed less, uh, less efficiently than wind in Germany. Um, it's not a very sunny country. Uh, which should have been obvious to the administration in Germany that implemented this policy. But, you know, I think there are a handful of people that had their pockets lined while they uh, screwed their own citizenry. Well, maybe that's coming to the U.S. as well. Either way, these things take time. Of course, um, increasing the solar generation in the United States will help for electricity demand during the day, which is beneficial in the summertime. But because that energy cannot be stored, to the extent that grids are increasingly reliant on intermittent renewables, those same energy grids have to have a baseload source of energy that can pick up the pieces when the renewables are not producing energy. And those have to be sources of baseload that can easily cycle up and down significantly. What can do that? Oil, natural gas, coal. So, uh, to the extent that the renewables take up a larger percentage of the grid, we will need more fossil fuel based electricity generation. Now, um, what does that mean for the United States in terms of nuclear? We are still waiting on the DOE's report on their expected uh, support of the uranium fuel cycle in the United States. That should be coming out this month. In fact, they said it would be a number of weeks. That was about six weeks ago. 
We continue to wait for this. We expect to see support for a uh, national uh, federal uranium reserve for U-308. We expect to see support for HALU, high assay low enriched uranium, which is for the nuclear Navy and SMR development, potentially even support for expanding enrichment in the United States, as that is one of the biggest um, bottlenecks for uh, the nuclear fuel cycle here in the States. We do have some enrichment, the Urenco facility. Um, we will have conversion when Comberdine's Metropolis plant is back online next year. But expanded enrich enrichment is necessary to meet the demands of the United States fleet. And we believe that that will come, and that will come relatively soon. So we are waiting on that. But of course, what is the answer to all of these type of crises? And we think about, if we're thinking long term, nuclear is the answer. And uh, we believe the administration knows that. Will they act on it? We will have to see about that. But clearly, uh, what is happening in Germany and across Europe definitely goes to show you that nuclear is the way to go in terms of reliable baseload energy that is also clean energy. So this movement by the Biden administration looks desperate, and we'll have to see how this plays out for the U.S. and for U.S. rate payers. Um, lastly, I wanted to report on the first Japanese boiling water reactor that has been cleared for restart. This is uh, uh, the restart of Unit 2 at Chugoku Electric's Power Company's Shimane Nuclear Power Plant. This is a 789 megawatt plant boiling water reactor that was shut down in 2012 following Fukushima reactor uh, disaster that happened in March of 2011. Japan, of course, shut down all 54 of their reactors within the next 12 to 24 months, and this one was no exception. This is a long time coming. Uh, this reactor has passed all levels of, of, of safety uh, regulations in terms of bringing that reactor back online and the governor's approval. This is uh, the Shimane governor, Tatsuya Maruyama, and he basically, this was the last element that they needed to get this plant back online. Now, they're still undergoing a couple of measures, which are uh, for, let's see, excuse me, these are for seismic reinforcement and other works by the end of February 2023. So we can expect with the governor's approval, and they have also achieved approval from the, not only the city in which this reactor resides has given the thumbs up to bring this back online, but all of the surrounding communities within 30 kilometers are all saying, good to go, let's do this. So now the gov governor signs off on it. They finished these last couple of uh, uh, pieces of upkeep that they are working on. And we should expect this plant to come back online in 2023. That will be number 11. We are going to continue to count these like notches uh, on the belt. And uh, this is number 11. We have 10 restarts so far. This will be number 11. Um, and we expect these to accelerate as we, we hear news stories. Now it's one or two a week of the Japanese federal government, the prime minister, the new prime minister of Japan doubling down and saying, we are going to uh, use utilize nuclear to the greatest extent possible that we can in order to avoid not only an energy crisis, but to move towards our quote unquote climate goals, our low carbon energy production goals that shoot to have 20 to 22% nuclear by 2030, which means another 20 plus reactors coming back online for Japan. This is a huge story. Um, our good friend Rick Rule, of course, has been saying that this is what has been needed in order to really kick off the bull market in uranium. Um, I think that bull market was already kicked off before this news, but now that this is here, this is unbelievably positive for the nuclear story and for the uranium investment story. All right, I'm gonna leave you guys there. Have a great night. I will see you again tomorrow. Cheers.